Okay, well, it's lovely to be with you, and uh, um, I met Richard, uh, I think it was in June at the Borough Ministers Conference, and then he recognised me from when we did a beach mission together many, many years ago. Um, but, uh, yeah, that was many years ago. But we're going to have our Bible reading, and then we'll look at a passage from Acts chapter 15, go into Acts chapter 16. Now, I should change that. If you can come this afternoon, please do, and hopefully it will um, be exciting and inspiring at what the Lord is doing across the world and uh, how we can all be involved in that great plan of getting the gospel to all nations. But Acts chapter 15, starting at verse 36, and going to chapter 16 and verse 10. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord, and he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Paul came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on a journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in the area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they travelled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. Paul and his companions travelled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Okay, so there's the, um, the, the title this morning, What Three Things Does Global Mission Need? And I don't know if you call yourselves UTBC, that's what I've called yourself today. What Three Things Does uh, Upper Trosland Need? And uh, it's, it's exciting to be here on an anniversary service. So this really is the same as 247 years ago. The same three things are needed today as they were then. And I don't know, is it in your mind that it's only three years to go now to 250? Okay, well, um, it's exciting, isn't it? And you think, well, what does global mission need? What does gospel work need? What does this church need? What does the church back home need? What does, say, a Christian union need in a university? Or what does a missionary organisation need? And there's probably lots of answers, but from this passage, um, the, the, the three things I want to draw out that we need here in Pontypool. We need here as we uh, have the the thing about the subject of, of global mission. And um, we're going to look at the... Do I need to point it somewhere? Or... Yeah, just, just point the other side. The side. Oh, the side one, okay. Just point down. Oh, there we are, there we go. We've got there. <laughs> um, and this is, this is the story. So Paul um, and Barnabas have had their first missionary journey, and you read that in Acts, Acts chapter 13 and 14, um, Pisidian Antioch and um, other places, Lystra, Derby, those kind of places. And they, they'd come back to Antioch and they were reporting on just how good the God had been in the gospel going out, people getting converted, 
and uh, they came back with these wonderful reports of the Lord at work in these, these places where Paul and Barnabas have been. Acts chapter 15, they had to deal with an issue in the church regarding circumcision, and that, and that was sorted. So at the end of chapter 15, Paul and Barnabas thinking, well, wouldn't it be great to do a second journey? Perhaps go back to the same places, visit those uh, new believers, strengthen them in the faith of the, of the of the Lord Jesus Christ, preach the gospel again. And uh, they agreed, I think this is a great thing to do. The problem was, Barnabas said, well, let's take John Mark with us. And Paul said, oh, well, hang on a minute. You can't be serious because he had left us in Cyprus. And, well, he can't be relied on. And there was this sharp disagreement, it says in, in the Bible. This, you know, this, they couldn't, come to a mind about this. And as a result, uh, Barnabas took John Mark and went to Cyprus, and Paul was thinking, okay, what do I do? Because I wasn't gonna go that way. I'm on my own, what happens next? Just as an aside, it's interesting, at the end of Paul's ministry, Paul says of John Mark, he is very useful to me. Okay, so there's a good ending to this story. The two people in the Bible that Paul describes as useful, one is Onesimus and one is John Mark. You think, well, the two captors I've chosen, those weren't the ones. But that's the side. Anyway, so Paul is here at the start of what he wanted to be his second missionary journey, thinking, I'm on my own. So what three things did Paul need as he started this new venture, this new missionary journey? What did he need? And as we look at the three things that he needed, then it's the three things that this church needs, it's the three things that the church back home needs, it's the three things we need in global mission. And the first is this, it needed new helpers. Paul was on his own. But by the end of verse 10 of chapter 16, there was a team of four of them, and we'll, we'll introduce those characters in a moment. And uh, the reason I put a picture of, of geese on there is, you know that geese fly in formation, a V formation. I can remember doing a training day for beach missions, I'm involved in beach missions as well. I can remember doing a training day, this was back, I don't know, 15 or so years ago. And uh, we call, I called the day, uh, Don't Kill the Goose That Lays the Golden Egg, which is a bit of an obscure title. But the idea of that day was to say that we work together as a team. And geese fly in formation because when they do, they are much more effective and go further. In fact, the way they fly means, I don't know how you measure this, but someone obviously has, that there's 71% greater uplift when they fly in V formation than if they try to fly alone. And there's lots of, I can bore you with facts about geese flying, but the, the, the lead goose flies until he or she gets tired, and then when he or she gets tired, drops back to the back of the V formation, and someone else takes over. It's the same, uh, the Tour de France, the, the alpha idea of the peloton, someone takes the brunt of the, the oncoming wind, and then when the sort of slip streams behind that, when a goose gets tired, so tired that they can't fly anymore, that goose will sort of go down to the ground and two other geese will go with it so that when that goose has recovered a little bit, the three geese come back together and working together, they catch up with the, the formation. There's also, the other one I like about uh, geese flying is, the geese behind the front goose honk and they do so in an encouraging way. So. If, if there's someone um, taking the lead, honk encouragingly, that's the idea, to keep them going, all right? You can, you can honk discouragingly, I think, but, uh, but the idea is this, it's a team working together. We're not meant to do things on our own. And what ha ha we have here is Paul, on his own, at the end of chapter 15, but by chapter 16, verse 10, there were three others on the team. The first is uh, with Paul himself. Um, I've called him that fervent man willing to launch out. He was the, the visionary, if you like. He had fire in his bones. He, in other passages, said, no, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Now, 
That should be true of all of us. But he was the let's go kind of person. You know, those kind of people who you, you're just um, out of breath listening to what they plan to do. Right? But we, we need those people who've got the vision, who are willing to step out, to launch out, who've got the come on, let's go together. Um, and all of us, to some extent, need to be like that. Have that concern, that fire on our bones, that desire to make the gospel known. But then there was Silas. I call him the, the faithful man um, willing to lead. He was the steady Eddie, as I see it. If you read chapter 50, um, 15, he was a man who taught, he was mature, he taught other Christians. He was the, hang on Paul, let's think about this, I, that's what I imagine him to be like, but he was certainly a mature Christian. He was a person who was just able to, to step, step alongside other believers and, and help them, encourage them, teach them, um, point them uh, to the Lord Jesus in their faith. And so you need people like that, like that in the team, don't we? We all need to have that kind of aspect in our work, um, in our own lives, but as a team, we need those people who have the maturity, who can work things through, who can be discerning, and Silas joined the team. Then there was Timothy, the young man, the timid man, the fearful man, but he was willing to learn. And as he joins the team in uh, chapter 16, uh, verse 1 and 2, and uh, he was well spoken of, the, the, disciple, the uh, believers in, um, it says in verse 2, the believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him, but he was young and he was nervous and he was probably thinking, I am the last person to get involved in missionary service. You know, here am I, send someone else. I imagine that was his kind of, he was not at this stage probably the up the front kind of person. Obviously, we know the end of his story where he became a church leader and uh, used much by God. But at this stage, probably converted on Paul's first missionary journey, he was a young man, and Paul says, because he has a good reputation, because he was a godly man, I want to bring him on the journey. And I think it was that where he learned to, to discover his gifts, and Paul was able to teach him and show him how to use those gifts. But in any gospel work, we need those who are newly converted who's saying i don't know where quite where i fit in this is all quite scary to me but i want to be part of the team willing to step out and think i don't know what it looks like for me but a fearful and maybe there's a part of that in us where you think of gospel work you think oh that's frightening that's scary but he was on the team and the other one I called the forgotten man, because in chapter 16, verse 10, it says, um, we got ready to leave. Well, it's Luke who's writing this, this account. So Luke was part of the team. We often forget about him. He was a clever man. He was a doctor, but he was willing to forego um, that career, if you like. He would have got money, for, obviously, working as a doctor, but he said, no, I'll be part of the team. And he was an integral part of the team, and, uh, but often forgotten, but just willing to be there, willing to serve. Um, not in it for his own glory, happy to be in the background. Doesn't mention his name explicitly, happy to say, I'm just part of the team, sharing the good news of Jesus. So what does global mission need? Well, it does need people to commit to gospel work across the world. There's huge needs. What does this church need? Well, these help us, isn't it? People to get involved, to get stuck in. And uh, we've all got different gifts, different abilities, different experiences, but together that gives us that 71% greater uplift, like the flock of geese flying in V formation. So you can't say there's no part for me to play, because um, that's just not biblical. But there is a part for you to play. It'll be different to someone else's role. So don't be jealous about someone else's gifts. God has given them gifts which are different to yours. But be willing to develop your gifts and use your gifts in gospel work, both here 
and further afield. The next thing uh, that they needed, I called it New Horizons. Now, um, I've got three boys, they're all married now, and um, I'm at the grandchildren state with six grandchildren, but as we were growing, as the boys were growing up, we used to play this sort of um, game of claims to fame. And if, sometimes it used to be quite convoluted, you know, I, I met someone who knew someone who met someone else who uh, happened to sort of see someone in the shop somewhere, you know, some of them were quite convoluted. But this is a genuine claim to fame. This is um, Colonel James Irwin, one of only 12 people to have walked on the moon. In fact, if you ever see pictures of the buggy on the moon, James Irwin was the, the, the astronaut who drove the buggy on the moon. Anyway, back in 1991, he came to Clevedon. Um, we had, in the days of tent missions, can you remember tent missions? We used to have a, we had a tent mission on Sorthouse Fields in Clevedon, and a, a chap called Roger Carswell was preaching, but we had various testimonies each night, and James Irwin came, came to a house to tea to start with, so that's my claim to fame. Anyway, so he walked on the moon back in whatever year it was, 72 or something like that. When he was a child, he had an ambition to go to the moon. Now, as a child, so this would be perhaps in the 1930s, something like that. So later in 1991, after he'd come to Clevedon, he wrote, he had an inter interview, and uh, this is what he said in his interview. He said, when I was just a little boy, I had such a fascination with the moon for me to go there. I told our neighbours, but they all laughed at me. I told my mother and father. They were somewhat amused. But then my mother said, son, man will never be able to live there. Just forget it. Just do something worthwhile with your life. Now that's um, his mother's advice to James Owen when he was uh, a young boy. But the point is, he had a vision to do something which seemed impossible, and, but because he had a vision and pursued that vision, it became a reality. And what you have in this chapter is Paul and the other three their eyes were open to new horizons, new opportunities. They were coming uh, from the east and basically they wanted to go north, but the way was blocked. They wanted to go south, the way was blocked. And they came down to Troas thinking, well, what do we do? We don't want to go backwards. We're committed to a missionary journey. What do we do? And so, um, you know the story, um, at night, Paul had a vision and a man from Macedonia, come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, I don't know how it happened, but so Paul had this vision at night. So the next morning, the four of them, having their well, conflicts or whatever they had in those days, Paul might have said something like, well, chaps, I've got this idea, which probably meant, oh no, what's Paul thinking about these this time? But he said, look, I think the Lord has shown us where to go. And together, they saw it was of the Lord and they were sensitive to his leading. And they said, let's go across over into Europe. Now, whether they called it Europe in those days, but they, they were just about to embark on a journey. They weren't planning for it. They weren't expecting to go that way. But because they were sensitive to the way the Lord was leading, they said, we step out in faith. We go not knowing what we're going to expect. We don't know these strange Europeans, these Macedonians. We don't know what they're like, but we're going to go and step out. And because they were open to new opportunities, because their eyes were open to these new horizons, that's how the gospel came into Europe. They arrived in Macedonia, Philippi to start with and then down to Thessalonica. And there they were able to share the good news of the Lord Jesus. The point is this, isn't it? That the Lord leads and guides. And we need to be sensitive to that leading. It's like Philip um, 
you know, we're preaching to crowds and crowds, and then was taken to the desert road where he met the Ethiopian eunuch. And because he was sensitive then, the gospel went into Africa. Because Paul was sensitive in this chapter, the gospel went into Europe. And what that looks like for you and for me might be different. So for some people, it will be uh, cross-cultural, stepping into a different country even, um, leaving sort of what you're familiar with uh, growing up in the UK and going to wherever it happens to be. So there's um, some mission partners who've got their commissioning service today going out with UFM who are going to Georgia, and they're uh, next to Russia. So they're going, in some ways, they've, they've, they've had sort of trips just to see what it looks like. They're stepping out in faith. It's, it's new to them, it's new horizons, but they're willing to step out. For other people, it might just be getting involved in a different area of ministry in the church where there is a need. Or maybe looking for, how else do we reach Pontypool or Clevedon, where I live? It's just being um, concerned for the need out there. Come over and help us and saying, we can meet that need. So it can be locally in our own church ministries. It can be locally in looking at other opportunities to share the gospel. It can be further afield, nationally and internationally. So new horizons and new helpers. Finally, um, oh, I was just going to show you a, a stat. Um, I'll, I'll share some more this afternoon. When the, the message came over to Macedonia Help Us, Paul saw the need, basically. I think sometimes, in, certainly in global mission work, to see the need is the first step. Because when you see need and see the opportunity, it gives us that vision. And here's just one stat. 82% of stand of the world people in the world, uh, non-Christians, do not know another Christian. That is a huge number, isn't it? And I suppose it makes sense in some ways because the population growth, the countries that are growing the fastest are, are not, the UK is not one of the fastest growing nations. Top, the top nine fastest growing nations in terms of percentage are all Muslim majority countries. Okay, and so 82% the world's population do not even know um, a non-Christian. And that is the come over and help us. It's, there is a need and we can meet that need. Uh, so the final thing is new hearts. And this is where we do what we can. We share the gospel. We go into all the world. We t speak to our neighbours about the Lord Jesus Christ. But this is where we look to the Lord and trust him to open people's hearts. That man there is um, a missionary uh, to the South Sea Islands back in the 18, 1840s. His name is John Geddy. And uh, John Geddy um, from Canada, um, he left with his wife and two small children uh, to go to the South Sea Islands to begin mission work there. Now that whole island chain was filled with cannibals and just before John Getty arrived, a British ship had landed um, to whatever, to do some trade or whatever, and the 20 members of the British ship, the crew members of the British ship, uh, were killed um, and then uh, cannibalised. And so when John Getty arrived in the 1840s, he was in that dangerous situation, a young family, um, they had to learn the language, uh, the language they've been committed to writing before, but bit by bit, people were converted. Then more were converted. And um, many years later, after he, you know, he died, they put a plaque up on the church where he ministered, and this is what it said. When he landed in 1848, there were no Christians here. And when he left in 1872, there were no heathen. Now, was it John Getty? Well, yes, in some ways that he was willing to go, but it was the Lord working in the hearts of, of these people, backed up with much prayer. It's interesting, after chapter 15 at the end, Paul and Silas were commended 
to the work by the brothers and sisters there. So there's much prayer behind the work. But it's the Lord who opens the hearts. And so what you have in Acts chapter 16, not in the verses that we read, in Philippi you have three, you have three people getting um, being converted. So you have Lydia, and then the slave girl, and then the Philippian jailer. And it's interesting, it's, it's, it reaches all strands of society really, doesn't it? So you have the rich and the poor, you have the upper class, if you want to call it that, the middle class and the lower class. You have family people, uh, single people. You have those who are respected in society, those who aren't. But in those people who are converted, the gospel comes and transforms all of their lives. So the, the respectable Lydia, her life is transformed. The slave girl, her life is transformed. The Philippian jailer, his life is transformed. And it says of Lydia uh, that the Lord opened her heart. And when we do gospel work, if we were going to do gospel work thinking, if I can give a persuasive argument, if I can have a, some, some yeah, proof that who Jesus is, and if I can present it well, that people are bound to come, become Christians. Well, we do want to present the gospel well, but it's not dependent on us, okay? It's God who's at work. And as we read this chapter, it's interesting that in all of these verses, uh, all these conversions, prayer is connected. So when we um, read about Lydia, it says this, uh, verse 13 on the sabbath we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer so there's prayer there and then uh, Lydia gets converted at uh, verse 16 once when we were going to the place of prayer we were met by a female slave so you have a conversion story linked in with with prayer and then um Acts chapter 16, verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And then the Philippian jailer gets converted. So in terms of global mission, what can you do? Well, I think it's great that any church thinks about who can we send or who can we support. And part of that support is the praying, isn't it? So behind Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke, they're the believers in Acts chapter 15, the end of chapter 15, who have prayed for them and are st still praying for them. And as people pray, God opens the lives, hearts of these um, unbelievers. A.T. Pearson said, every step in the progress of the Great Commission is directly traceable to prayer. Um, and that's true, isn't it? We don't do this work on our own. So on your 247th anniversary, what three things does Upper Trosland Baptist Chapel need? We need helpers, new helpers, don't we? People who are willing to commit to the work here. Um, and, you know, in, I'm not very sick here, be careful what I say, let's say in 100 years time, that's not going to be you, is it? Okay, it's going to be the next generation and the generation after that. So, new helpers, new horizons, always looking um, to the Lord. Lord, what would you have us to do to reach this community? What would you have me to do in gospel work, whether it's here locally or even further afield? But we pray because we need new hearts. We need people who, who God is at work in whose lives are transformed and changed for the gospel. A good friend of mine, non-Christian, um, for 40 or so years, uh, was diagnosed with cancer, riddled his body basically. He was given three weeks to live. And in that three weeks, he lived a bit longer than that actually, but in those three weeks, he trusted Christ. Um, and, it, and I think of him thinking, of all the people who'd heard the gospel, he'd heard it most, I think, of all the people who've been prayed for, I think he'd been prayed for the most because those people knew him. And then after 40 years, you think, there's no hope, is there? Because, and then it's converted. So let's pray. Uh,
concerning gospel work as a new a helpers, new horizons, and new helpers. Now, have we got a, a final hymn? I, I, I didn't did send the. We, we have? Mm-hmm. Excellent. What have we got to? Who is on the lawn, sir? Who is on the lawn, sir? That's a good one. Okay, so when the music plays, we'll uh, stand to sing Who is on the lawn, sir?